Hi, everybody. Welcome to the presentation portion of Virtual Bird Bash with Gulf Coast Bird Observatory. Uh, first thing this morning, we have Taylor Bennett, who is the coastal biologist uh, with us at Gulf Coast Bird Observatory, and she's going to be talking about her beach nesting birds project. Um, the comment section is open and I'm going to be monitoring that. So if you guys have any uh, questions for Taylor, you can put those questions in the comment section and we'll get to those at the end. Um, so without further ado, welcome Taylor Bennett. Good morning, everyone. My name is Taylor Bennett and like Celeste mentioned, and today we're going to discuss beach nesting birds of the Texas coast. For those of you who haven't met me, I started working at GCBO as an independent contractor in 2019. And by the end of my contract, GCBO hired me permanently as a coastal biologist. I coordinate programs for shorebird conservation, where we use monitoring to track numbers and distribution of individuals over time. Like Celeste mentioned, feel free to comment or you can email me. My email is right there. And then picture here is our Wilson plover chicks, which is one of our main target species I monitor. For those of you who haven't heard of Gulf Coast Bird Observatory, we are a nonprofit organization. Our main headquarters is located in Lake Jackson, Texas, off of Highway 332 West. Normally, our nature store and trails are open Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. Currently, our nature store and office is closed due to COVID, but we'll be back open next month. Our main mission is to protect birds and their habitat around the Gulf Coast Gulf of Mexico and beyond. Our purpose is to be a reliable science-based partner with communities, educators, governments, industry, individuals, and other conservation groups to pursue our mission. Our integrated approach to accomplishing our mission is through scientific research, land protection, and education and outreach. We have numerous research and monitoring projects and studies. Just to name a few, we have Smith Point and Cuba Hot Watch American Oyster Catcher Study. Modus Towers Project, Loggerhead Strike Project, Eastern Willet Migration Study, Air Tower Reef Study, and Oyster Reef Study. The main projects and studies that I'm in charge of are the Non-Breeding Shorebird Study, the Beach Nesting Bird Study, and then the Black Scammer Project. I also assist in other studies and projects as well, along with Sue Heath, our Director of Conservation Research. We offer land protection through our site partner network. Currently, we have over 71 sites. And then our tropical forest fund protects full annual cycle of migrants and tropical biodiversity. We also have numerous education and outreach events. One of our new projects is Splash, which focuses on education, educa educating people about marine debris and conducting beach cleanups. I believe Kelly is talking about that at one. We often do community booths and presentations. And each staff member is also required to write a nature note article each month. For the breeding season these uh, uh, few months, I'll be updating everybody on the status of our Wilson's Plovers lease terms at our sites. We also have YouTube videos, virtual events, and Facebook posts. And we are a host of a monthly banding station. So every third Saturday of the month, we band birds at GCBO. Celeste has also created an online bird school, which is totally free for anybody. So back to what I do. During the non-breeding season, September through March, I uh, do one kilometer transects along the beach. I currently have five sites that I monitor. And those are Matagorda Peninsula, Brian Beach, Quintana Beach, Follett's Island, and we've just recently added Surfside Beach. We also do area searches behind the dunes. The only areas are located at Matagorda. They are Colorado River Flats, or CRMF, and Three Mile Cut. During the breeding season, April through August, I currently have two sites that I monitor. They are Matagorda Beach, so Matagorda Peninsula up to 18 kilometers instead of the full 36. And then I have three areas, Three Mile Cut, Dunes Drive, and CRMF. And new this year, we are surveying Sargent Beach, which we simply basically put into two categories, Sargent North and Sargent South. 
And normally we monitor Dow Chemical Plant A, but due to COVID, we were denied access last year and this year. Luckily, we have a couple of Dow employees that survey for us. So just to give you an idea, GCBO only covers a small portion of the upper Texas coast. Other organizations such as Houston Audubon, American Birth Conservancy, and Coastal Bay Bend and Estuaries Program cover the rest of the Texas coast. We often partner with American Bird Conservancy and work with other organizations. So at the top here, Houston Audubon and ABC, they cover Bolivar Flats, East Beach, St. Louis Pass, and Highland Beach. Then in the middle here is us, which is Matagorda, Bryan, Quintana, Bollitz, Surfside Beach, Dell, and Sargent Beach. And then at the bottom here is Coastal Bay Bends and Estuaries. They monitor Mustang Island, Charles Pastor, Boca Chica, and Boca Chica. Most of the funding is provided by U.S. Fish and Wildlife. However, we do receive funding from other organizations such as GLO and also nonprofit organizations. So just to give you an idea of what our areas look like, this area is Matagorda Beach. So during the non-breeding season, we survey up to zero all the way to 36. It's a long, long route. It's about roughly 22 miles. And just a side note, we do not walk these. We survey by four-wheel drive truck or UTV. So during the non-breeding season, we survey this entire area and also Three Mile Cut and CRMF. Here's a closer look of what CRMF looks like. Then during the breeding season, we only survey it up to about half, which is right about here. And then we monitor Three Mile Cut, Dunes Drive, and CRMF. Another area we monitor is Bryan Beach. This is what it used to look like. It used to have five areas and six kilometer transects, but now it's just three transects. We've lost the last three transects in all areas due to erosion, habitat loss, predators, and disturbance. And the erosion is so bad that you can't even get past here because there is a bluff blocking the entire beach. So to make up for those lost transects, we added Quintana in fall 2019. We pretty much um, monitor by vehicle up to two. However, the last transect, no vehicles are allowed, so we simply walk it. Also in 2019, we added Follett's Island, which has proven to be very successful in terms of providing hab wintering habitat for all our target species. And brand new this season, per request of the mayor to help achieve their status as Bird City, we decided to add Surfside Beach. Then I like, like I mentioned before, we normally monitor Dow Plant A report because it only during the breeding season because they have a very special black skimmer colony. Uh, this uh, back in the 60s, this used to be an oyster shell parking lot. And then they started to notice that black skimmers started nesting there. So they created that designated area just for the black skimmers. GSBO didn't start monitoring this area until 2017. The area is currently surrounded by electric fence to protect from predators. They also created their own water trough specifically for the chicks to drink and also to keep the uh, skimmers cool. And then the skimmers, their whole area is surrounded by water. So the skimmers have plenty of habitat to feed. Dow also has a small lease turn colony. Unfortunately, they are in a parking lot. So they are not quite as successful. We still try to keep track of them, but usually they're not successful at all. So what species do I monitor? During the non-breeding season, I'm focused on threatened, endangered, and species of high concern. So I monitor for piping plover, snowy plover, red knot, black skimmer, and American oyster catcher. During the breeding season, I monitor Wilson's plovers, least terns, black skimmers, and snowy plovers. 
uh, snowy plovers are only south of Texas in East Beach. We have yet to find a snowy plover pair nesting in our areas. So what do we monitor? During the non-breeding season, September through March, I keep track of the number of species and type of species, behavior and habitat, whether those birds are banded or flagged. Also keep track of disturbances, so number of people, number of vehicles, number of dogs leashed and unleashed. And we recently added number of balloons. We added number of balloons because they kill wildlife birds and they are a threat to sea turtles. And just roughly, just this past year, we collected over 900 balloons, which is very, very bad. And hopefully we can dwindle that number down. During the breeding season, April through August, I'm more focused on nest searching and monitoring. I banned Wilson plover adults and chicks. I also banned black skimmer chicks. We determine nest fate and productivity. And we also keep tracks of disturbances, such as those that during the non-breeding season, as well as threats such as predators and weather. So our breeding species. This is an example of what we post around our potential nesting habitats. As you can see, we put posts and signs. And then we also have rope and flagging to keep people from trespassing. These are currently at CRMF, Three Mile Cut, and Dunes Drive. So one of our target species is the Wilson's plover. They are slightly larger than a piping plover and a snowy plover. Their most distinct feature is their big black bill here. And they also have long pink gray legs. They are often mistaken for killdeer, but killdeer have an eye ring and a double collar. Notice that these guys only have a single collar and no eye ring. Oh, and here is, this one is banded VH. He was actually my first male Wilson's plover I ever banded when I first started. So a little bit about the uh, Wilson's plover. They're only here during the breeding season, mostly during the winter. They winter in Central and South America. There is currently no conservation status for them. However, they're only protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. They are considered a species of high concern. So they really do need to be federal, um, federally protected. They are endangered and threatened everywhere else. They currently don't have a status for Texas because uh, majority of the population is found in Texas. Here's an example of CRMF and Wilson's plover nests from 2016 and 2020. As you can see, 2016 was the most productive by all the green dots. And then as years go by, the number of nests uh, diminish. So fewer and fewer nests are found because the habitat is constantly changing. In 2016, the breakwater did not exist. So once the breakwater was created, a big lagoon formed right here in the middle. Another breeding species is the least tern. They are the smallest tern species. Don't let that fool you. They have Napoleon complex. They can be very, very feisty. They are identified by yellow beak with a black tip. They have short yellow orange legs and a black cap. They currently have no status for Texas. The only population that has status is the interior population, which is endangered. We don't know if our population is endangered or not. However, they are still protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Another breeding species is the black skimmer. They have long black wings and their most distinguished feature is their oddly shaped bill. They have a smaller um, upper mandible and then a longer lower mandible. And they get their name for skimming across the water. That's how they catch their prey. 
The black skimmer is a unique case. Within the last 40 years, 70% of the population has declined and nobody knows why. Dow Chemical Plant, Chemical Plant A Freeport hosts one of the largest nesting colonies in Texas. So it's very, very important that we keep monitoring that area. So Wilson plovers are considered solitary nesters. They create their own territories and typically do not nest close to other Wilson plovers. Females tend to incubate the, when first few nests are laid, both male and female take turns incubating the nest and keeping watch. Pictured here is a female incubating her nest. And with these guys, we monitor individual pairs, nests, and chicks. And here is a male Wilson's plover keeping watch. This one happens to be banded YU. These terns are different from Wilson plovers. They are considered colonial nesters. They tend to nest in large colonies. We monitor from afar to avoid disturbance. So with these guys, we just count number of adults, number of incubating, and number of chicks. We do not monitor individual nests unless some struggle. We see some uh, nesting on the beach alone, which is fairly fairly common, but obviously um, not very successful. Black skimmers are also colonial nesters. We monitor from afar to avoid disturbance. And we also keep count of number of adults, number of incubating, and number of chicks. This is the black skimmer colony at Dow. It is a very, very large colony. It can have up to 1,200 adults. And then pictured here are adults and chicks gathering around the water trough that Dow created. So they are drinking and staying cool. And also notice the electrical fence surrounding the area. Nest. So the male Wilson's plover creates a, what we call a scrape, which is a bowl in the sand. They create this by using their belly and feet. At Matagorda Beach, they nest near the dunes in the sand and shell. They can also nest uh, near the mud flats as well. And also if rack is high enough, they will also nest in that. They typically lay about two to three camouflage eggs. Three eggs are considered full clutch. And if a nest fails, they will often re-nest and usually the re-nest, they will end up with just two eggs. They take approximately 25 days to hatch. And notice the vegetation around that is to help shade the eggs. Least turn nests, they are, their bowl is more shallow. They typically lay only one to two eggs. They are normally out in the open, but nest to, they nest next to each other. They take about 20 days to hatch. The black skimmer, they prefer nesting in oyster shell. This is a colony at Dow, but they also nest in the bays uh, where oyster catchers nest. And then we, they have lay up to four eggs. We often see gullbill terns nesting with them. They take about 23 days to hatch. Chicks. So the Wilson's plovers, all shorebirds and waterbirds are partially precocial. So when they hatch, they are fully feathered, their eyes are wide open, and they are able to run and walk as soon as they, are, they hatch. So within a couple of hours, they are up and running. They are able to feed themselves, but rely on the parents to lead them to their feeding areas, either near the mud flats or by the shore. They have super long legs and a big bill like their parents. These guys will often feed on insects and on their invertebrates. And then they are able to fly within 35 days. A family of Wilson's plovers are called a brood. One or both parents will stay close to the chicks. Pictured here is J5, also known as Janet. 
with her two chicks, Rocky and Eddie, who are also banded. Both the female and the male will stay close by to the chicks and protect them. Now, the Eastern chicks, they typically stay close to their parent, also partial pre, um, partially precocial, so they are able to walk around. They cannot hunt for themselves because the least turn diet is mostly fish. So they heavily rely on their parents for food and shelter. They are able to fly within 20 days. And pictured here are a couple of the least turn parents feeding their chick. Black skimmers, again, partially precocial, like the Wilson Plover and least turn. They also stay there near, the, near the adults and walk around. They also heavily rely um, on their parents for shelter and food. They are actually born with their bill straight. And as they grow, their bill becomes oddly shaped like the adults. Once they're able to fly at 30 days, they will often stay longer with the parents to learn how to fish with the rails. And pictured here are also gold billed terns, like I mentioned before. They do tend to nest with the black skimmers at Dow. And all, oh, here's a parent black skimmer taking care of her chick. So banding, like I mentioned before, I banned Wilson Plover's adults and Wilson Plover chicks. For the adults, we trap and band while they're incubating a nest, usually when they have all three eggs. We don't use bait, simply we, we simply rely on their instinct to incubate their nest. We use two methods, the box trap and news carpets. And the bands they get, they usually get a US federal government metal band and a red band with two white letter codes. Last year, I banded 15 adults. The chicks, usually right when they hatch is when we band them. We float the eggs so we know when they are going to hatch. There's no need uh, for trapping. You can just pick them up. Uh, that rarely happens. Usually we are chasing after them. Uh, the, they re also receive a US federal government metal band. And then they also receive a plain plastic red band. Last year, we banded 28 chicks. So here's an example of what the box trap looks like. Simply put, the box made of metal rods and mesh with an opening in the back. I like to think of Looney Tunes when Elmer Fudge trying to catch Bugs Bunny. So we have the box here. We have a stick here and a string. And then at the end of the string, we have the intern. So this is Morgan from this past year. We cover the intern with a camo sheet. And she has her binoculars, so she keeps watch of the female or the male coming back to the nest. Once the adult sits on the nest for about a minute, we pull the simply pull the string and the trap closes. And then the plover is captured. Another method we use is news carpets. They are pretty much panels of chicken wire with fishing line nooses attached. As you can see, the nest is right in the middle here. Typically with these guys, we uh, use a recording of a chick call or another adult Wilson, or a call from another Wilson's plover to lure them to the nest. Here are the news carpets uncovered and then covered. You can barely see them. They blend extremely well with the sand. With each trap, we wait up to 30 minutes if the plover doesn't fall for the trap, we simply abort mission to avoid abandonment. We also make sure to cover ourselves with scent away, and we use a broom to brush away our footprints to avoid predators finding the nest. So here are some of the data we collect when banding adults. We have a GPS location, which is basically their nest ID. We determine whether the adult is male or female. We choose a band code and a metal band number. And then with the adults, we take some measurements. So we take, we measure the bill, we measure the head and common, 
the tarsus, the wing, and we take weight. So male or female, here is what the male looks like. He has dark markings around his eye and usually a very dark color. The female is more drab looking, so she doesn't have those dark markings. Here's an example of what the color code looks like, close up. And then the band, the metal band. Unfortunately, you can't see the number portion because the band is turned. We send all this information to the bird banding lab. And because we need permits and proper training in order to do this. So nobody. So unless you don't, unless you have a permit or a training, you cannot ban birds. So here is an example of how we measure the bill and measure the culminant head. Here's how we measure the tarsus or the leg bone. And then we also have a special ruler, which I don't have a picture of. We just measure the, uh, the length of the wing. So banding chicks, like I mentioned before, we use a float egg test to determine hatch state. We usually band them right after they hatch. We use their nest ID as a GPS location. We note who their parents are. And they, on their left leg, they receive a metal band. And on the right leg, they receive a plastic red band. We don't take any special measurements. We simply want to get the chicks back to their parents as soon as possible. So here's an example of what the float egg test looks like. We simply put the eggs in a jar of water. And then based on how the eggs float in the water, we can determine how old they are. So as they get older, they tend to float more, more and more closer to the surface. And here's an alive example of what that looks like. So based on how this egg is floating, I would usually say about 11 days, 11, between 11 and 13, so about 12 days old. And here's an example of what the banded Wilson plover chicks look like. These guys were extremely lucky. They just hatched, as you can tell, they are still wet. So you can see that metal band and that red band. Unfortunately, only one of these guys made the fledging. And then we often have an extra egg left in the nest. Usually that is infernal. It is rare that we have all three chicks. And these guys' parents were BJ and E5, who have paired up again this year. Also note the balloon string. Like I said, balloons are a huge threat to birds and sea turtles. So we do keep track of nest fates. As you can see, this is the uh, data from last year. So we did have a majority hatch. Unknown means we cannot tell what happened to them. They simply disappeared. There are like no eggs in the nest. There, there's no pairs and there's no tracks around the nest. Washout is pretty common, especially with the weather. For instance, if a tropical storm comes through. Depredation means it was killed by a predator. And notice your ghost crab was our most common predator last year. Uh, one did abandon, usually by disturbance. And one was human caused where the vehicle pretty much straddled the nest and the plover was forced to abandon. So last year, only nine out of 38 chicks fledged. So nine seems to be about the average amount, which is still pretty low. We also keep track of disturbance and threats. Here are a few of the predators. So coyote, very common. Like I mentioned, ghost crab. Ghost crabs will eat eggs and chicks, surprisingly. 
We also have a laughing gull pitcher here and also a feral hogs. Feral hogs will trample and also dig up nests. What is not pictured here are raccoons, gullbill terns, night herons, grackles, caracara, and uh, we recently discovered foxes. So here's an example of what a predated nest looks like. Note the big eggshells. Usually when the plovers hatch, you also cannot see the nest cup. Usually when the plovers hatch, there is very teeny tiny uh, shell fragments because the parents actually carry the eggshell away from the chicks. And here, of course, the predator is a coyote. He left his mark, as you can see by the scat. And you can also see that he dug up the nest cup. So you cannot tell where the, well, you don't see any eggs or anything. And then ghost crab. Here's a good example of what a predated uh, nest of a ghost crab looks like. Here's a before picture. You see the one egg here. That's when it was just starting. And then in this picture, you see that same piece of log and that vine. And then we have a ghost crab burrow right here. So notice the nest, the eggs and nest cup are completely gone and in its place is a ghost crab barrel. So obviously that got predated by a ghost crab. Disturbances and threats. The most dangerous to wintering and nesting shorebirds are vehicles and people. Here's an example of what July 4th look, uh, weekend looks like. This was 2019. So from the pier up to the entrance, we counted up to 153 vehicles and 133 people. It is an insane amount of people. Holidays are the worst for uh, breeding shorebirds, especially a Memorial Day holiday where it is during the peak of the short um, beach nesting bird season. So resting shorebirds and breeding shorebirds use rack, which is debris left by um, tide. They use this as a food source and also shelter. Uh, rack also indicates the high tide mark. They are filled with all sorts of invertebrates to plover, for the plovers to feed on. So here's an example of snowy plovers using the rack to um, shelter themselves. And here is a typical situation which we have on the beaches because of the Open Beaches, uh, Texas Open Beaches Act people are allowed to actually drive on the beach all year long. So luckily, this is a non-breeding season. So these birds are able to fly. However, during the breeding season, we have chicks that cannot fly and they can only run and hide. So we try to warn people about driving too close to the dunes and the shore. Another big threat to resting, shore, resting and nesting shorebirds are dogs off leash. Dogs off leash will disturb nesting birds, keeping them off the nest. If nesting birds become disturbed, they fly off their nests, leaving their eggs exposed to heat and also predators. Plovers and least terns do not know the difference between an unleashed dog and a coyote. So here's an example of an unleashed dog that was very close to my nest. Human footprints were also observed. I can often tell that dogs were unleashed because the human footprints will be nearby them or the dog prints will be somewhere else and human footprints will be closer by. With dogs, Wilson plovers end up abandoning their nest Thus, leave the, thus leaving it um, exposed. So we ask people to please keep their dogs on leash for the Wilson's plovers, but also for oncoming vehicles. They are crazy drivers on the beach. 
So the best way to keep your pets safe is to keep them on the leash. Uh, trash and debris are also a big, big threat as well. Uh, this was a couple years ago in Bryan, Bryan Beach. Uh, notice this plover nested near shotgun shells. Plovers tend to nest in debris and trash, so it makes it even harder for people to realize uh, where they are. And here is a Wilson plover re-nest. As you can tell, there is a ton of plastic trash around. We got a couple of plastic bottles, we got a coffee cup, we got a shoe sole, we got a rubber glove here. So we really need to keep the beaches clean. And then we have balloons. Like I said, balloons are a constant threat to wildlife, especially birds and sea turtles, because they will become entangled or mistaken for food. We started collecting balloons in 2019. And like I said, we collected over 900 balloons this past season. So pictured here is a balloon next to one of our beach nesting bird signs. So how do they protect their nests and chicks? Well, some plovers try to lead you in the opposite direction of their nest or brood. They will give you a look and they will constantly talk to you, saying, come hither, come, come follow me. They will dive bomb other birds. I witnessed a female Wilson plover actually knocking over a killdeer chick who just happened to wander in her territory. They often hide their chicks under their wings. Uh, least turn and black skimmer. Like I said, they typically nest in a large colony, so safety in numbers. They are very, very protected of their nests. Least turns in particular will squawk and dive bomb whoever comes near their nests and babies. We have seen least turns actually attacking Wilson plovers. They will also hide their chicks under their wing. And they, both the Wilson, um, also the Wilson's plover, they do a thing called broken wing. So they pretend they are injured in order to lure the predator away from their nests and chicks. Black skimmer also does broken wing, but not very good because their wings are so large, it's kind of awkward. So here's an example of what the broken wing technique looks like. As you can see, the Wilson plover has, this is a male. So his wings are completely spread out on the ground and he's often flapping, flapping around, trying to pretend that he's injured and vulnerable. So that predator will actually go after him versus his chicks or nest. Here we have a mutant plover, not a mutant. This is pretty much a female Wilson's plovers. Count the legs, there are six legs. So this female is hiding two chicks under herself. They will often do this. So another thing we do is stewardship and education. So protection and outreach. We try to protect non-breeding and breeding areas through various methods such as signs, fencing and flagging. We participate in various outreach events to educate people more about resting and breeding shorebirds. So like I mentioned before, we post signs near where we know birds are rest nesting or resting in hope of people understanding not to trespass. Pictured here is posts and signs at Three Mile Cut. This is protecting a least turn colony that decided to um, nest here. We have signs for resting and nesting to our birds. The signs are in English and in Spanish. So here's an example of what our resting shore bird sign looks like. And then we have, and then again, here is what our beach nesting bird sign looks like. So like I mentioned before, we often do community, constantly educating and intending outreach events. Saturdays are our typical outreach days. This particular photo was Sugarland's World Oceans Day organized by the Girl Scout here, Jocelyn. And also pictured here is Kristen Vale. She is very famous in Galveston. She is with the American Bird Conservancy. 
and we often partner with her. Another event that I did was environmental extravaganza in Bel Air. Pictured here is our former RV host, Cheryl. And here we have a table of educating materials. Uh, we were trying to teach kids the different um, bill shapes and depending on their prey that they feed on. Uh, new this year, Celeste year has um, created a children's book called Winnie the Wilson's Plover. Came out just last year, but we were not able to give out due to COVID-19. It simply goes over the life of a nesting Wilson's Plover named Winnie and some of the challenges that she faces when she's trying to nest and raise her chicks. It is free to all kids. Um, in future outreach events, we will be um, handing them out. They can currently be found at Matagora Bay Nature Center. So if you would like one, you can go there. But we also have an online version on our website. So we often do beach cleanups as well. This was a beach cleanup at Bryan Beach, hosted by a Sea Scout who wanted to get an award. And Chris and Bill of ABC also helped me with that. Then during November, we had an experience auction where you can bid on experiences. Here, this couple won the experience of going out in the field with me. So you get to spend the life, spend the day as a coastal biologist. Here is Patty and Sanjay. And here they are holding a banded Wilson's Plover. Uh, this one was a female VL or Valerie. They also got to experience us uh, banding chicks as well. So it's an awesome, awesome experience. You should bid on it. We also participate in bird camp. In 2019, I did a presentation on banding. Pictured here is my intern, Amelia, showing the kids what the news carpet uh, traps look like. Hopefully this year we can do a presentation. And in 2019, we were able to ban skimmer chicks at Dow. So we had a huge banning event where we were able to ban 20 chicks. We had a couple of volunteers from US Fish and Wildlife, ABC, and also a couple of my Dow volunteers as well. And as a retirement gift, this is William DeGroote. He was one of my very um, faithful Dow escorts who helped me survey the uh, skimmer colony. He um, retired in 2019. So as a gift, he was able to help us ban two chicks and got to actually hold them. So our goal by helping these species, we are hoping provide an umbrella of protection for many other species with similar habitat needs. This is a recent photo of CRMF. As you can see, the lagoon is almost dry, but you can see thousands and thousands of birds. These are all breeding abyssids. We got skimmers here in the background. We got pelicans. We got every turn species. And we also have laughing gulls around. And this is near our Wilson plover nesting area. So the Wilson plovers tend to nest along the edge here. So CRMF has become an absolute paradise for other shore, for other shorebirds and waterbirds. So what can you do to help GCBO and our mission? Volunteer, assist our biologists with research in the field. You can assist with education programs. You can assist in information booths at regional events. You can assist at our offices. You can assist groundskeeping. You can become an RV host. You can also become a member. And we have many ways of people of how you can donate as well. We also have many items available for purchase in our online nature store. So we have books, t-shirts, hummingbird feeders. There's also symbolic adoptions. So you can adopt an oyster catcher pair, or 
to help my research, you can adopt a Wilson's Plover chick. And hopefully this year we can also adopt Wilson Plover adults. We also have native plants for sale and et cetera. So here is our website information and our my email as well as Celeste's email. All right. Do we have any questions? All right. Thanks, Taylor. That was great. Um, yes, I have been monitoring the Facebook comments and if anybody watching has any remaining questions, there's still time to um, ask those. So go ahead and put those in the comments. Um, first of all, Cheryl says hi. Hi, Cheryl. <laughs> hi, Cheryl. <laughs> um, and uh, so for the questions, how long do these birds live? That is a good question. Um, well, we do monitoring just so we can figure out how long they live. Um, I believe plovers live up to 12 years, I want to say. Okay. Um, and uh, I know that the snowy plovers don't nest on our beaches, but theoretically, would the snowy plovers and the Wilson's plovers be able to nest on the same beach? Yes, very much so. Right. Uh, snowies tend to uh, prefer more open areas, but they will nest along each other. Do they, would they be territorial with each other? Would they yes, they would. <laughs> <laughs> between them? <laughs> oh no. Um, why is it important not to disturb the birds? Well, because uh, especially for resting shorebirds, they are here to refuel and gain enough energy to uh, fly back to their breeding grounds. So they are, um, it's very important for them to not be disturbed. And during the breeding season, they have nests and chicks. So if you do disturb a nest, um, that nest will not survive. It, the more you disturb it. Yeah, you kind of expose the chicks. The yeah, you expose the chicks to predators and abandonment and it's not good. Yeah. And and so in Texas is not friendly to chicks either. They need to be no. protected from that. Um, no, especially with our areas, we can't protect all the habitat. We also can't close off the beaches. Yeah. So. Um, do you use exclosures and why or why not? Uh, because the, the Wilson's plover does not have a status, they are not considered endangered or threatened. Uh, we do not use exclosures. They also cost money because <laughs> we don't have the money for them. But I know with piping plovers, they are endangered. So they tend to use exclosures with them. And then we try to not um, make it obvious that the Wilson plovers are nesting because we don't want people to mess with them. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and then finally, what can uh, people watching do on the beach to help the birds? Is there any like general rules we should abide by? Uh, stay uh, in the moist sand. Always, always drive slowly and walk carefully. Always be around, um, aware of your surroundings. Keep the beaches clean. And if you see any um, activity that seems to be illegal or if people are messing with the birds, you can contact the warden and hopefully they will be able to help. But you can also educate people of why not to do that, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Good the word. All right, yeah. well, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Taylor. Thank you. All right, and if you guys wanna read more about Taylor's stuff or adopt one of those plovers that she was talking about, those links are in the description below. And next up, we have Martin Hogna, who's going to be talking about bird strikes. And I hope there's still eight chicks left in the nature store. So please yeah. adopt. <laughs> <Go down. laughs> All right. Bye. Bye.